Earlier this evening, I was at the Nova exhibit, 35 Wall Street. I was there with some friends, our governor, and several other leaders. It was my second visit and tour of the exhibit. And while I was there this time, I had opportunity to spend some time with Segal and Manny Manzuri. They are parents of two beautiful daughters who were captured and killed on October 7th. And we shared an understanding of hate and violence against us. I say us because there's no way I could stand here tonight in solidarity with the Jewish people because of my relationships and my Judeo-Christian heritage and not understand my own coupling to that struggle. It was several years ago that I was asked a question because somehow the media got hold of something that, that I supposedly said. And that was I was going to tell my congregation not to vote because of who was running for president. And when I spoke to the journalists, I said, I've got three reasons why I would never tell my people not to vote. And those three reasons are Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney. Those are the names, for those of you who are not familiar, of one African-American and two Jewish individuals who understood the need to speak up to do something about the realities in this nation, especially with the right to vote. They were killed, brutally murdered, and those who perpetrated it, well, it took a lot of time to try to bring them to justice. So I stand here tonight with shared interest, shared struggle, shared history. Victor Hugo said, one can resist the invasion of an army, but one cannot resist the invasion of ideas. And it is ideas, ideologies, things that people believe and construct and then act on. And that's what we're up against. So when you think about what's going on in the Middle East, yes, it's being played out, in the brutality and atrocities of war, but it's a clash of ideologies. One ideology believing strongly that Israel and Jewish people don't have a right to exist and the others fighting, protecting themselves against 3,000 years of attempted genocide against them as a people. Culture is what people believe, how they behave, and the outcomes they produce. Culture is overt and covert. Culture is the character and personality of a society, the totality of that character in its traditions, what they believe and pass on from one generation to another. Their attitudes, which is their spiritual, intellectual, and e emotional dispositions. Their customs, what they practice as a people. Their institutions which express the culture and systems and structures and practices and 
policies and perpetuate the culture. Their language, their idiomatic, idiomatic expressions, their colloquialisms, their buzzwords, their code words and dog whistles, their trends, the dominant trends and issues and narratives that shape the spiritual and moral and social and political and economic landscape at a given time. From its inception, our nation has had a hermeneutical crisis. And we can come at this in many, many different ways. But tonight, I'd like to point out that hermeneutical crisis. Because for me, it's foundational to the way things are in this nation. They've changed a lot. We've come a long way. But Thoreau said, for every thousand people hacking at the leaves is one person hacking at the root. And what are the roots of racism and anti-Semitism in our nation? Because it's inherited from other places in this world. From its inception, America has suffered a hermeneutic of black inferiority and anti-Semitism that has shaped and informed the American social mind. And when I say a hermeneutic, I'm talking about a method of interpretation, interpreting the Bible, the scripture, the sacred word. And this distorted hermeneutic has often been employed to justify and perpetuate systems of oppression, including, for me personally, because of my ties to it, Jim Crow law, segregation, anti-Semitism. And these interpretations misuse biblical texts to support ideologies of racial and ethnic superiority, slavery, and black inferiority. Biblical justifications, proponents of slavery, frequently cited passages like the curse of Ham in Genesis to argue that black people were divinely ordained to be subservient. They interpreted this curse as a justification for the enslavement of African Americans claiming it was sanctioned by God. The doctrine of subjugation. In this hermeneutical framework, slavery was benevolent, a benevolent institution ordained by God where enslaved individuals were portrayed as needing the guidance and control of their white masters. The interpretation was widely accepted and promoted, of course, in the South to maintain and legitimize the institution of slavery. Jim Crow and segregation, biblical segregation, a post-Civil War hermeneutic, moral superiority, racial inferiority, moral inferiority, deicide, when it comes to the Jewish people and anti-Semitism, deicide and scapegoating. Anti-Semitic hermeneutics have long roots in Christian history. With the accusation of deicide, which is the killing of God, being a central theme, Jews were historically blamed for the crucifixion of Jesus. A misinterpretation based on selective readings of New Testament texts. Stereotypes and persecution. And these interpretations fuel stereotypes of Jews as malevolent and untrustworthy. And of course, it led to widespread discrimination, violence, and exclusion. In America, anti Semitism was manifested through social ostracism, economic restrictions, and violent attacks, often justified through these warped biblical interpretation. 
This hermeneutic of inferiority and anti-Semitism had devastating effects on American society. It legitimized and perpetuated structures of oppression leading to centuries of suffering and injustice for African Americans and Jewish people. The misuse of biblical texts to support ideologies. It demonstrates the power of interpretation in shaping societal attitudes and policies. But you say, well, Dr. Bernard, this is all in the past. Well, it was just recently that a representative from the state of Florida made a factually inaccurate statement that black folks were better off during Jim Crow and that black families were more intact. This representative compared today's black culture with that of the Jim Crow era, when black people in the South were subject to multiple forms of state-sponsored discrimination. This illustrates that it's not over, that there's a long-lasting impact on the mind of the oppressed and the oppressor when we're talking about ideologies that are given divine authority. And please don't under, misunderstand me. I'm a Christian, so I'm not attacking Christianity. I'm just being brutally honest with the roots. Because what we're dealing with now are simply the fruit of those roots. We should not be in a place where we're still seeing the global impact of this way of thinking. Illustrated in a recent rape of a 12-year-old girl in France by three young French boys because she was Jewish. We need a modern biblical reassessment, theological reflection that challenges the status quo and how we've thought about things. I remember reading the deed to my home that I purchased in Long Island when our family moved in. And I read it carefully, and at the bottom of the deed, it said, no Jews or blacks allowed to buy this house. We think it's over. No, it's not over. But I'm saying to you tonight that it's deeply entrenched in our culture, in our systems, and our structures. But I've got good news, and the gospel is always good news. <laughs> Jesus said something powerful. He said, if two of you agree on earth, I think this is earth, concerning Anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. It's called the power and place of agreement. And when Mitch Glazer asked me to come and share, it was an opportunity to stand in solidarity, to stand in agreement for a cause that I believe in. And that cause is fighting against anti-Semitism. If two of you agree, just two, can you imagine that? I used to think of the power of the two, but then I thought about, wait a minute, just two? It speaks to the transformative power of unity and solidarity. It highlights that even a small number of individuals, when united in purpose, faith, and action, can bring about significant change. It speaks of the collective energy and focus that can lead to significant outcomes. It reflects the idea that unity magnifies strength and a small 
united group can achieve what seems impossible individually. I'm here to be a part of that group. I'm here that in spite of our past, we're living in the greatest country in the world. And I'm proud to be an American. But I also know that we've come a long way through many struggles, and there are many things that still need to change. And that change begins when people are not afraid to use their voice and their platform to speak the truth to the social mind and to what's happening in our society. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs>